there. Before we get started, I want to let you know I'm having a little contest. If you want to enter to win one of my busts of Anubis, whether that's an unpainted kit or a fully painted piece, all you gotta do is subscribe to my channel, follow me on Instagram, and share this video, and your name goes in the hat. I'll be picking a winner July 28th, and I'll send you a message letting you know you won. Okay, now back to what you came here for. Hey, I'm Freddy, and in this part two video, I'm gonna show you how to make a mother mold using Plasti Paste. Last video, I went over step by step how I made my brush on silicone mold of my clay Anubis sculpture. If you haven't checked that out yet, I highly recommend watching that video first. I left a link in the description. In this video, I'm going over step two of that process. Laying up your clay walls, how to make a plasti paste mother mold, and how to properly do a jeweler's cut. A mother mold, also known as a mold jacket, is a reinforced rigid outer shell casing that supports your flexible rubber mold in the proper orientation. Mother molds can be made from from plaster, fiberglass, and even resin. Normally, I'd use fiberglass and polyester resin to make a mother mold for something like this, but I want to give the Plasti Paste a try to see if it's a better alternative. Still, setup is exactly the same for either of the two. To get started, I'm going to need to mark out my case line on my silicone mold, which I did last video, so I know where to build up the clay walls. In the previous video, I explained why making a sketch of your mold is vital to figure out where to part it. In this sketch, I decided the best way to make the mother mold would be to divide it into three parts. Have a shell come off from the back, running straight down from the front of the ears, and having two shells that separate from the left and right of the front of the face. Pro tip, when working on rigid molds and you want to find the perfect case line, you can do so by shining a flashlight along the side of the object that you want to mold. Then, trace a line along where the shadow meets the light. For the kind of mold I'm working on, I shouldn't really need to do this. But if you're making a rigid stone mold of a face for a latex mask, for example, you want to find the best case line to avoid any undercuts that would typically happen around the ears. Once I have my case line marked, I can start building up the clay for the first half of my flange. For this sculpture, it'll be more beneficial if I lay it down while I'm laying out my clay. So I don't distort the mold, I lay it on some soft upholstery foam. And so I don't waste more clay than I need to, I eat up some space with some 2x4s and medium density packing foam, which I'll be building the clay on top of. You can use anything from scrap sheets of plywood to 2x4s to cardboard. I just prefer these because I have a lot laying around and they can be easily reused. Once I have proper support, I can start working my way around the sculpture and placing down worms of clay along my part lines. I'm not too worried about making it neat, I just want to get the bulk of the clay on my sculpture first. You can use any type of soft clay to lay up the clay wall. Here, I'm using wed clay because I had a lot of bags stocked up. Normally, I'd use clean clay or EM210 because they're malleable and quick to work with. I'm making sure to build up more of a flange than I'll end up needing because it's always helpful to have more room to work when I lay this stuff up. When smoothing out your clay, there's a couple different neat tools you can use to get uniform smoothness. Once the clay is mostly flat, I like to smooth out the plane with a serrated kidney or scraper. This kind of works like sandpaper. It brings the high and low spots down to the same plane. So when you do a pass with a smooth scraper, everything's level, or at least mostly level. It's good practice to rake in different directions. After raking the clay with the kidney, I'll go at it again with the smooth side of the straight scraper. You can buy a whole variety of different types of scrapers. Me personally, I like to buy doubles, that way I can cut some in half. When I have these half cut kidneys, it's easier for me to work in tight areas. Around this point is a good time to make sure that my clay is butt up against my silicone mold. Then I like to take the edge of one of my scrapers and scrape in a registration key line along the sculpture. Depending on how tight of a space you're working with, sometimes it's beneficial just to carve it out with a clay wire tool first before you go over it with a rake. Just make sure your key is beveled. The less of a bevel there is, the more friction there's going to be when you're demolding, and more of a chance of gradual deterioration over time. At this point, I'm going to trim my clay edges a tad bit with my knife. I'm making sure to leave myself enough room for bolts when I apply the paste. Then I'm going to give my clay a final smoothing with a wet pottery sponge. It helps blend away the lines from that rough smoothing process. 
Here, I'm dragging the sponge along in one direction, but most of the time, it's better to go in small circles. Once I hit the clay with a hair dryer for a little bit, I spray some mold release on the silicone and the clay. Be sure to follow the instructions on whatever release you use. I personally like to brush mine in on the silicone with a chip brush, just to make sure I have all my areas covered. Now, we can move on to applying the Plasti Paste. So what is Plasti Paste? Plasti Paste is a two component fiber filled putty that's designed to hold on to vertical surfaces. You can use it for mother molds and you can also use it to make industrial size repairs, kind of like Bondo. Currently, SmoothOn offers two versions of Plasti Paste, Plasti Paste 1 and Plasti Paste 2. For this project, we're using Plasti Paste 1. From my understanding, the main difference between the two is that Plasti Paste 2 can be painted, it's also harder and more heat resistant. I'm told it's also a little less viscous when you mix it. No matter what kind of paste we're using, it's not good for you. Be sure you're working in a well-ventilated environment, have the proper clothing protection, and proper gloves. This stuff isn't fun to breathe in, so have a fan, or at least a respirator. The paste needs to be mixed at a ratio of 2 to 1. It's best to put everything in equal cups, then combine them into one big mixing container. When measuring out part A, you'll find out pretty soon that it's thicker than Dexter's mom from Dexter's laboratory. The fibers that are pre-mixed, oh, okay, hold on. The fibers that are pre-mixed in make it difficult to stir, so make sure you have a durable mixing container. When dispensing it into cups, make sure you pat down as much as you can into the container. Or, at the very least, leave a little bit on top to compensate for any air gaps that are in the cup. Be sure to use a thick wooden mixing stick. Tongue depressors break too easily. Put some elbow grease in and mix it up for about 5 minutes or until you have a consistent even color in your mixture. Be sure to keep constantly scraping the size of your container. You have a pot life of about 45 minutes. Still though, work in reasonably sized batches. When mixed thoroughly, the epoxy paste has a doughy consistency. I recommend applying it by basting your silicone with a wooden paint stirrer. For maximum strength, you'll want to build up a thickness of at least a quarter of an inch. As the epoxy sets, it'll become easier to clean up the edges since it becomes more rigid. Towards the end of its pot life, right before it fully sets, I recommend using a chip brush dipped in rubbing alcohol to smooth out any pokey bits on the surface. Now, let this cure for at least 16 hours at room temperature before starting the other side. It's been 16 hours. For the next side, I'll only need to lay up one clay wall. But before I do that, I'll have to clear out the clay along the top seam. No matter what kind of clay you use to build up your clay wall, it should be cheap enough for you to afford to buy multiple batches as opposed to reusing the same clay over and over again for the wall. The more you reuse clay, the more impurities it'll accumulate and the rougher your mold wall is gonna be over time. Just something to keep in mind. Once the clay is cleared out, I do the same thing all over again. So I don't get any unwanted mechanical locking problems, I'm going to fill in any holes along the seam of my first paste shell with clay. This happened because I put the first layer on too thick all at once. I'll be sure not to do that next time. Now since I have one side of the mold done, I'm going to seal that edge by brushing on a few layers of Sonite wax. The epoxy paste is pretty porous along the edge, so to ensure I have absolutely no mechanical locking, this wax fills all the microscopic holes. You could also line the edge with aluminum foil and apply Sonite wax, but just the Sonite wax alone should do just fine. With some spray on mold release, of course. I ended up jumping the gun a little bit. Before I lay up any more epoxy, I'm going to add some wedges of clay on the edge. This way I can pry it open with a screwdriver when it's all solid. This time I'm going to lay the epoxy down thin first, especially along the edges. Then I'm going to push and pull to build up thickness to reduce the chance of big air pockets. Once I have that distributed to my liking, I'm mixing up a little bit more to cover up the rest of the mold. If I see any pink, it's too thin. I'm purposely leaving some of the key edges exposed along the seam so I can push from the other side to pop out the silicone mold. Now after a little rubbing alcohol, I wait 16 hours to do the other side. 
For the final side of the mold, the only clay buildup I need to do is to make a clay flange along the edge of the epoxy. I'm doing this so I have easy access to the inside seam of the mother mold to pry these pieces apart, using a screwdriver or a pry bar. It's helpful to add a few all the way around the mold. Something I forgot to do when I laid up my first side of the mold was to mark where I'm going to be drilling my bolt holes. Since I have a lip key going along the edge of the mold, I want to mark above that lip along the inside of the mother mold, and transfer those marks with a sharpie on the outside of the mold so I know where to drill. I prefer to do this at this point because it reduces the chance of me making a wrong mark when everything's encased and I end up drilling too close or too far away from the sculpture. Rule of thumb for me is that the hole should go about a half inch away from your silicone and about three or four inches apart from one another. Now, just like before, I apply some paste wax. This time, I'm applying it to my silicone because I have more surface area here that could potentially cause some locking problems. After giving it a final spray down with some spray on mold release, it's the same old layup story all over again. This time, in high speed. Now it's the next day and everything's cured, so I'm going to start to drill out my bolt holes with a quarter inch drill bit. Now that I have all my holes, I can start prying the mold open. The first time is going to be the most difficult. I find it easier to hammer it in a little bit along the edge at a time, so it gradually opens up along the seam. I knew the back piece would be giving me the most problems, so I'm using a rubber mallet to persuade it to open. Never go full on Thor for this though, just give it a couple love taps. Alright, my silicone mold is done, my mother mold is all laid up, I can start casting, right? WRONG! I'm gonna need to cut the silicone mold open in order to get the clay sculpture and our future cats out of the mold. I need a seam, but I also need my seam to fit perfectly back together. A jeweler's cut does this by creating bumps and ridges that force the two halves to key back together in their original position. To do this, we're gonna need a brand new, fresh, curved X-Acto blade. This particular type of blade is typically used for wood carving. I'll start by cutting my back seam first. I take my knife and cut along where I want my seam no deeper than 3 16th of an inch. As I drag my blade along my silicone, I'm twisting my blade side to side with my fingertips. After my first line, I start back over from the top of the cut. This time, prying open the edges with my fingers as I do the same thing over again. The twisting knife action creates those bumpy hills and valleys that will key your two halves of the mold back in place. Using a curved blade is important because as you pry open the seam and do multiple passes, the curved blade moves around your previous bumps and valleys. Whereas a straight X-Acto blade would cut right through them and destroy the keys. The hardest part about this technique is spreading open your mold as you cut. You can buy mold spreaders, which are like reverse pliers, which when squeezed pry your mold open as you go. But for the kind of mold I'm doing, it's pretty much a requirement that I have a second set of hands to pry open the mold for me. This takes a while to master and get the hang of. I recommend practicing on smaller scrap pieces of silicone first. Anyway, for this mold I'm cutting a seam along the back and directly under the chin. Once that's all properly cut, it demolds just like a glove and the clay sculpture underneath is 98% intact. Once the clay sculpture is demolded from the silicone, chances are there's still a little bit of clay or a little bit of impurities left in the silicone mold. Before I go about making any final art pieces, I make a cast with the expectation that I'm not going to be using it for anything. The first cast will pull out any clay or dried up bits of clear coat out of the mold and clean it for my future production casts. Typically, if the first cast comes out clean as a whistle, like mine did, I set it aside and leave it untouched. That way, if my mold ever deteriorates, I have my very first pull, which should be the most accurate to my clay sculpture, to remold. The more pulls you get from a mold, the more deterioration it's going to have over time. The more your mold deteriorates, the more your pulls are going to look less like the original. This is my first pull that I expected to throw away. You can see that there's little bits of clay that got captured from the casting process. 
Other than that, this turned out fantastic. The silicone captured all the detail of every little pore on the face, and my jewel cut was so effective, you can't even see the seam line, other than a little bit of flashing here and there. This is the one I'm gonna be setting aside if I ever need to remake my mold. And this is my first production casting where I got a little artsy and used stone filler to make it look like it was made out of carved granite. Overall, I'm very happy. No air bubbles, no imperfections. The mold was done perfectly. So, on the subject of Plasti Paste, this was my first time using this product and it might be the last time I use it. I'm sure there's good reasons why you would use Plasti Paste as opposed to making a fiberglass mold jacket, but overall, for making this mold, I don't think any of those reasons were apparent. For starters, I don't like the 16 hour wait period between coats. I'm not someone who likes to watch paint dry. I'm sure if I added a little bit more catalyst and added a little heat, I can chomp those numbers down. Down, but when I compare Plasti Paste to polyester resin when I use fiberglass layup and I can potentially get this kind of mold done in the span of a day, it's no competition to me. Also, I just hate how hard this stuff is to mix. You gotta really put in a lot of elbow grease in there and dude, I'm a millennial. We don't like to put the work in. I do like how Plasti Paste holds to vertical surfaces, so if I was making a mold of something that I could not lean horizontally and 100% had to do it vertically, I might use Plasti Paste. But I don't see that happening. Now I'm going to be a stereotypical YouTuber and ask you to hit that like and subscribe button down below. If you like this video, you should check out my Instagram, at FreddyProps, where I always post more current work and all my current projects. Also, a little reminder, I'm giving away one of these Anubis busts for free. All you gotta do is subscribe to my channel, follow me on Instagram, and share this video, and your name goes in the hat. See you next time.